Hello, this is Jack Olmsted. I'm with GMO Free News, and I'm talking today with uh, Lena Kat Katschek, the senior organizer for Food and Water Watch in Michigan. We're going to be talking about the Flint water crisis. Whoops, and I wasn't on camera here. I'm on camera. I'm a real person. My <laughs> lips are moving. This is Lena. How, how's it going in Detroit, Michigan? It's awesome. It's actually a sunny day here today, so it's good. Now, have you felt any winter yet? You got snow? Is it cold? Uh, we had one day of snow and, uh, a few weeks ago. That was enough for me. I'm not a fan of winter, so um, the mild El Nino year is quite pleasing to me. How did you end up in Detroit? Where do you come from? Um, I grew up outside of Detroit. Um, so born and raised here in Michigan. I've lived some other places around the country, but uh, always come home to Michigan. And how about schooling? Where'd you go to school? Um, I graduated from Michigan State, so I'm a proud Spartan. Um, and What's I got the fight? Do you, do you know the fight song? I know. Oh man, I know most of the fight song. Okay. <laughs> I know the important parts. Uh, so I graduated from the School of Natural Resources there with a degree in environmental studies. And then I have a master's degree in environmental education and marine science from Florida Institute of Technology. And how did you get this gig with Food and Water Watch? Um, well, I've been working in Michigan um, around water issues for about 10 years um, and had always um, I had worked previously, I worked for Clean Water Action, which is another fantastic nonprofit organization that's done some really great work in Michigan. Um, but I really, I, I just personally, I was really interested in food issues and it was something I'd never worked on before. And so when Food and Water Watch posted the position here in Michigan, I was like, wow, this is a great way for me to combine all of my interests. It's kind of a dream job. Um, and it has been. It's. I mean, I'm really privileged to be able to work with some amazing people. Um, we have a great team and on um, issues that I really care about. Um, and I'm particularly proud that we take a really strong position on the issues that we work on. You know, we ask for what we want and uh, work really hard to get it. On a little tech um, point, can you bring your camera down a little bit so there's not so much headroom we should have done that on the green room a little bit more can you go bring bring down a little bit more there you go okay yeah that's that's more like 60 minute style okay <laughs> i know we're kind of cutting off the foodopoly book up at the side i know you really uh -oh. want to, you want to get everybody to put that under the tree uh, yeah. They could. Uh, also, we have Frackopoly that will be coming out soon, so folks should uh, be looking forward to that. It's going to be a really comprehensive look at fracking in this country and, and what has really transpired over, especially over the last few years and, and the organizing that's taken place around it. Now that's the book? Yep. Uh, booked by our executive director, Winona Hobbit. Can, can you share the cover of it? I know you can. I don't have it yet. <laughs> you don't, you don't have it. No, it's. I mean, it's it's still a couple of months, I think, away from being out on bookshelves, but it's coming soon. I see. So you say this is a dream job. So what's your typical day at the salt mines at uh, Food and Water Watch in Michigan? <laughs> um, I would say there is no typical day. <laughs> Every day is pretty different. Um, we are working on a, a pretty big uh, host of issues here in Michigan right now. So um, some of our top, our top priority issues include working on Line 5, which is a 62-year-old pipeline owned by Enbridge that runs under the Straits of Mackinac. Um, it is probably the worst. Well, the University of Michigan has said it is the worst possible place in the Great Lakes for an oil spill to occur. So we're working with our partners in the oil and water don't mix campaign to shut that pipeline down. Um, we're also working to oppose some new um, proposed gas pipelines that would bring fracked gas from the East Coast through Ohio and Michigan and export that gas to Canada. 
Um, so we're fighting those. Hopefully they will not get approved. Um, we also work um, you know, quite um, intimately on the Detroit water crisis and, and all of the issues around water in Detroit. Um, we've been supporting the work in Flint and we do some national work um, working to stop the dark act or the what you know the house of or the u.s house of representatives has called the safe and accurate food labeling act but we call it the denying americans the right to know act and that would prohibit states from labeling gmos um so we're working to make sure that senator Sabinow um introduces a bill uh, in the Senate that would include mandatory labeling for GMOs and not take away state rights. Um, and then lastly, we are working to keep, um, well, I guess there's a couple of <laughs> things. We're busy. Uh, we're working. Do you, uh, do, you have a web, do you have a website? Yeah, it's. Uh, uh, do you want to share it? You, uh, you, I'm sure you've got a lot of this stuff on your website. So instead of just yeah. visualizing, we, you can actually give us a little tour around your website. Yes, and we have a brand new website. So let me. How many people are in your office? Um, just two. So me and we have another organizer named Mariah Yurata that works on our pipeline campaigns. Um, and you work with students. We work with students, yeah, that's actually how Mariah came to us. We organize on college campuses. We have a Take Back the Tap campaign to get bottled water off of college campuses. And Mariah started volunteering with us her freshman year, the sophomore, or yeah, freshman year of college and was an intern, worked on our campus campaign, and now we're so happy to have her on as a full-time organizer. Um, so let me share this and you're very familiar with uh, google hangouts i understand you use this on a weekly basis we do but not not like how we're using it right now so get bear with me while i try and figure out these functions. oh i didn't want to put pressure on you i just want to let well, people know I'm that putting a little pressure about the screen share right now let's see okay okay so should I go to the Google Hangouts or the desktop? Google Hangouts, right? Uh, well, you have to go to the Google Hangouts and over in the. There you go. Now yeah. you're looking at me. Okay. Yeah, we're looking at Here's your our website. website. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is the Michigan page of our website. Um, it talks about some of our top priority campaigns. So, the pipeline fights I mentioned, um, the work that we're doing in Detroit and Flint. Um, the work that we're doing to fight factory farms, and we just have um, a new report that we put out through the Less Equals More campaign, um, looking at how factory farms are um, impacting Lake Erie and how federal farm dollar bills are not solving the problem. Um, and then we have the, we're working to keep the, we have a new campaign that's not on here yet, um, working to keep uh, fish farms out of the Great Lakes. So, yeah, so that's our website. How now? How do I unshare my screen? Oh, there we go. See, you, you got it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> uh, talk about how you got involved with Flint, the Flint um, water crisis. Well, so in at that towards the end of May of this year. Um, we worked with our partners in the People's Water Board Coalition and specifically Michigan Welfare Rights Organization to organize um, a two-day international social movements gathering on safe and affordable water and housing. Real long title, so I wanted to make sure I get all the words in. Um, and that's where I met Melissa Mays. And so Melissa shared her story about what was going on in Flint. Um, and it was, I mean, we were, I think, all horrified that this was going on just up the road from us. And we, nobody really had any idea what was happening. And I can remember, um, you know, that Monday going back to work and talking to 
my supervisor about it and I'm like I think we need to start working on something else and he's like you've got too much on your plate and I said okay but listen people are being poisoned in Flint and he's like okay <laughs> and then by you know the end of the hour we had our water staff in DC on and we're trying to Google information while we're on the phone together and really couldn't find any information out there at the time that was talking about what people were actually experiencing. And so um, I'm looking at a timeline right now of articles in May and there really isn't anything. There, there was an article uh, April the 22nd and then May is, is like a desert. There's nothing there. Yeah, there was something, I think the earliest one was like the Washington Post or uh, New York Times or something. It was a big paper that it covered it, but it wasn't like a high profile story for them. Well, maybe. in in July, the nation covered it and in that July they, they got an article in the Atlantic. Uh, NPR, um, Michigan Radio started covering it in July, July 13th here. Yeah, and so, well, what I think sparked a lot of that was, um, so Melissa had come down and participated in this social movement gathering, and the focus in the People's Water Board, just, you know, we all felt very compelled to connect our stories, because the things that were happening in Detroit were very similar to what was happening in Flint. Um, a lot of the problems that we were seeing around water were the direct... Um, results of emergency management in those cities and so um, within some of our leaders within the People's Water Board Coalition and Melissa organized the Detroit to Flint water journey which happened um, just around the beginning of, of July so around the 4th of July that started and it was a 10-day walk from Detroit to Flint uh, connecting all of you know, connecting our stories and, and sharing our stories with people along the way. Um, Did so you I, participate in that? Um, I was sort of more on the logistical end of things at that time. So um, the actual water walkers, they, because we, this was organized uh, within probably less than a month. Um, and because of logistics, they kept uh, the group walking from day to day pretty small and then we would have larger groups gather for some of the events in the evening. Um, but it got, you know, a lot of press so um, we really helped to push things out through the press and social media. Um, we worked to help turn folks out to events um, and really help get, you know, the, the walk the, or the journey, the attention that it deserved. And it was a big collective effort. You know, there was a lot of organizations and individuals that um, took on pieces of this to, to make it happen. And I, I think at the at the head, you know, the people leading this were really Melissa Mays and Kim Radigan from Michigan Human Rights Coalition. And they did a fantastic job. Is there a place where we can go to read some of these stories of the water water? Walkers? Um, there should be stuff. So the People's Water Board Coalition also has a new website I can bring up and share with you. Um, and we'll, they're also on Facebook. Um, but you can find the Facebook through, um, through the website. And let me see. One day I'll be real fast at this screen sharing thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, <laughs> so you here's- got a, You got a master's in environmental education. Yes, um, so here's the People's Water Board website. Um, it's, it's, we also just got a new website. So um, there's lots of information about events that we're organizing. We're right in the middle of our 12 days of holiday justice for water. Um, and so yesterday 
was sort of the big day. It was um, national or International Human Rights Day. And so folks from Detroit and Flint and, and other um, places around the state, we all met in Lansing uh, to talk with our lawmakers about a package of, of bills that were just introduced into the Michigan legislature. What are the different components or topics that you see with this Flint water crisis? You got emergency manager, that yep. could be an issue. You've got the corrosiveness within the, the water, so you got kind of the science involved. You've got the politicians, the, the political process, you've got the citizens, you've got the kids, you've got the lead. I mean, in, in your mind, what what are the different topics here? I mean, I think the main thing, you know, all of this kind of stems from the emer emergency management law and our, our lawmakers in Lansing taking away municipalities' rights to govern themselves. So, so you, think that's the big, you think that's the big story here? You think that if there wasn't an emergency management law, this crisis wouldn't have happened? I don't think so, no. I don't think the water shutoffs in Detroit would be happening like they were either if it wasn't for emergency management. Um, we probably wouldn't have this Great Lakes Water Authority that's you know, in the process of moving forward either. Because a lot of these decisions were made by emergency managers that, you know, they're not accountable to the people of the city. They're, there's no democracy involved at all in making those decisions. I, I understand that the only thing they cannot do, and that's miss a bond payment. Yeah. They, they can do anything else they want except miss a bond payment. And, and how they get that money to make the bond payment, uh, they can do anything they want. Yeah, and, the, and water systems are often the, the very first place that emergency managers look because they're oftentimes a city's biggest asset is, is their water de department and the water infrastructure. So... You know, we've seen many municipalities where they sent emergency managers that the first thing that they did was, um, you know, request proposals to privatize the water system. What do they get from privatizing water systems? Um, I wish I could tell I mean, I can tell you what the citizens get, and they get increased rates, decreased service, decreased transparency. Um, I think that... You know, we've seen a trend in, in just privatizing everything, like outsourcing these jobs that were normally public service jobs to private companies. So if they privatize the water system, who is responsible for the distribution of that water through the pipes? We're talking old pipes that need to be replaced. I mean, who shoulders that responsibility? The private the rate participation? Payers. The rate payers. The rate payers, it all comes on the back of the rate ratepayers. Yeah, and it depends how your privatization is structured. Um, we don't see a lot of private water companies outright buying um, uh, municipal water systems anymore. It's more often that they're taking over the management and operation of those systems, um, which they call public-private partnerships. And we call privatization. You call it privatization, and what the citizens get basically are increased rates. Increased rates, yeah, absolutely. And reduction of services. Reduction of services. Um, you know, we see sometimes jobs are cut by as much as a third. Um, and it, it, you know, it's interesting. You may be bought out by, for example, a private water company that's based in New Jersey. So when you're calling to report a service problem and you could say, hey, I'm over on Griswold or you know, whatever street, they have no idea where that is. 
you know, you're dealing with somebody far away that doesn't even, you know, have intimate knowledge of your water system. Now, I don't think, you know, DWSD, Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, has a history of being poorly managed. But I still think that a public system is the best option because at least there is accountability. Now, I mean, outside of emergency management, of course, but, you know, if, when you have a government and and a municipal water system, there is a, a method for accountability there that you do not have when you have a, a private company overseeing your system. When we were in the green room, you shared some data with me uh, in terms of how much municipalities get charged wholesale for the water and how much they sell it to their customers. I wonder if we can go through. Can you bring that up? Mm -hmm. See, by the end of this session, you're going to have this screen sharing down. I'm going to be so fast. <laughs> um, That's right. Yeah, so we had a really amazing um, intern two summers ago work on this information. And so uh, Detroit Water and Sewerage Department um, it services, right now it services 127 different municipalities. So each of those municipalities are in long-term contracts with DWSD, usually you know 20 to 30 years or somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and then um, they buy water wholesale from DWSD. The city of Detroit, since they own the water system, those residents buy their water retail from DWSD. So, for example, um, you know, I live in Ferndale. So Detroit is responsible for getting water to the front door of Ferndale, and then Ferndale is responsible for getting that water to their customers and then billing their customers. So um, what this chart is showing is the, um, the, the wholesale monthly charge in dollars for that municipality, so what they're charged from DWSD, how much they're paying per thousand cubic feet um, by DWSD, what that municipality is charging their residents per thousand cubic feet, um, and then the difference between what DWSD is charging and what they're charging their residents. So if we scroll down and look at Flint, um, and this again was from 2013-2014, Flint is, was at the time being charged by DWSD $13.01 per thousand cubic feet and we're charging their residents $75.20 per cubic feet, um, which I think was the highest increase if we scroll down. Yes, by far the highest increase um, in water rates. Probably only second to my city, which gets a real good deal on water. Ferndale, um, uh well, heck of a deal, $5.20 yeah, well, we per cubic border, foot. <laughs> so we share um, the eight-mile road border with Detroit, so they don't really have to get it very far. Um, so some of these places where you see that they have really low rates, like Hamtramck is another one. Hamtramck is actually a city that is completely surrounded by the city of Detroit. Um, so the, the cities that are paying lower rates, it's because they're, they're really close to Detroit. The, they don't have, the water doesn't have to go very far. So, so you, you have not delved into what makes up the, or, um, what, what the residents are charged. So if we're looking at the Flint River or the Flint City where they're they buy it for thirteen dollars and then they sell it for seventy five dollars. We don't know why, where where that money goes, do we? Um, yes, and oh. I'm gonna. So all of the money, the way it's set up. Um, where did that report I just had go? Um, let me find this. Um, 
I don't know off the top of my head, but I know that it is in this report um, because it's set up in in the state law that all of the money has to go for um, it goes to a certain fund. I may have to like delve into this report later and, and come back okay. to the answer if that's okay because I don't have it off the top of my head right now. Um, okay. But yeah, they do have to say where it's, it's going to because that was one of the questions that we had initially um, and part of the reason why we, we did the research to begin with because we wanted to know if if that money was going to the general fund or if it could go to the library or if they were actually using it for water. Um, and I know that what we did find was that it had to go someplace specifically. But what happened in Flint, and so, um, was that in 2011 when they had an emergency manager there, the emergency manager illegally raised the water rates in, in Flint. And so, um, fast forward to this year, it was, I, I want to say about 30, a 35% increase in water rates since between 2015 and 2011. And so residents in Flint were paying in the neighborhood of 7% of their monthly household income for their water bill. And the United Nations, um, depending on the source, the United Nations or the U.S. EPA, um, your average monthly water bill shouldn't exceed between about two and a half or three percent of the household income. So, uh, where where do you go from here? Um, what in terms of two thousand sixteen? Um, how involved are are you or? Uh, Food and Water Watch uh, Michigan going to be involved in this Flint water crisis scandal? Uh, yeah, scandal. I mean, there is so much accountability work that needs to be done right now, and I see us playing a role in that. So I think it's going to be very important that the governor and the Department of Environmental Quality in Michigan are hold, held accountable for what they did in Flint. Um, one of the things that we're working with Melissa on, as I mentioned yesterday, um, we are working with some lawmakers and they introduced a package of bills over the last few weeks that would start addressing some of the, the issues um, uh, that helped, I guess, facilitate some of the things that happened in Flint. So, um, one of the bills, and there's nine of them, so there is a, a bill that declares that water is a human right um, and that all people have access to safe, affordable water um, for domestic purposes. Um, now, these are bills that are going through the, 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 the state house. State, 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 state house. house. Um, and slowly um, we are seeing some senators start to pick up bills and introduce companion bills in the Senate. Um, there's also a bill that will address water affordability. Um, there are two bills that address decriminalization of illegal water hookups. So right now, what we've seen is, you know, several people, especially in Detroit, are reconnecting to water after their water has been turned off. And right now, that's a felony. Um, so the maximum penalty is between four and five years and you know, they are just trying to meet a basic necessity and So the decriminalization bill would would make a first and second offense a, a criminal or a civil infraction and the third offense a low-level dis, dis, misdemeanor um, uh, I know that I know that uh, Let's see. I'm getting let's feedback, see, I'm getting feedback with sudden, with sudden. You didn't do anything. Did you? Nope. That's odd. That's odd. Can you hear it? Do you have a window you open? A window open? No. A different window. Window. Um. No. I was wondering if maybe my space heater is making noise. I think it's like the fan on my computer. 
there is some noise coming through there, but now I'm getting feedback from myself. So when I talk, I hear an echo. I don't hear that at all. What would you want me to do? I don't, I'm just commenting that I can now hear myself in an echo chamber. Oh, no. Um, another bill that's in the package, and this is really important to Flint, is that there is a bill that would address pre-flushing. So pre-flushing was a practice that the DAQ used in Flint. Um, the scientists from Virginia Tech said it was a technique that no credible scientists would use. Um, and so they are, this bill would get rid of pre-flushing so that they would, so to prevent situations like what happened in Flint from happening again. Um, Can we go back to the shutoffs? Can we go back to the shutoffs? Sure. When, when Detroit, when Detroit gets the water shut off, what does it cost to get it turned back on? What does it cost to get it turned back on? It just depends how much your bill is. So it, it, it really depends on the situation. Um, sometimes, you know, it, sometimes you have to pay, you know, depending on how high your bill is and what assistance plan is open to you, um, depending on how, what your bill is, that sort of determines what you pay. So the mayor has this um, or 10, 30, 50 plan um, where, you know, if this is your first time entering a payment plan, you put down 10% of your water bill, then you have to pay a certain amount per month, plus you're accruing new water bills. If you default on that Now I'm getting a watery sound coming from your speaker. You're, you're sounding like you're from out, outer space. Um. Okay, now you're human. Okay, I'm human. I don't know. We were having internet problems today, so that could have been part of it. I think if we, if you were having internet problems, uh, your picture would be degrading, not your audio. This is really so, odd. And now I don't hear an echo. Okay. Well, <laughs> we're making progress then. <laughs> yes, we, yes, we are. Well, let me share. Um, These little blips. Because I, I know in Flint, in order to get your water turned back on, it's four hundred and fifty dollars. It's like yeah. So flat each rate. yeah, each city does it a little different. Sometimes they'll require you to pay your bill. I want to share. Um, and then in Detroit, I think they have these smart meters, and these smart meters not only pick up what you owe, but they can also pick up what your neighbor owes and what the house down the street owes, and they tack it on to your bill. Well, they yeah. Sometimes they do estimated bills. It's it's. It's just, it's all awful. Um, and, and we don't have, we do not have an affordability plan and the assistance plans aren't working. So um, what I'm sharing right now is the water assistance resources that exist for the city of Detroit right now. So you can see the programs run by Detroit Water and Sewerage Department. The WAVE program no longer has funds available. Um, but they would provide a $500 payment if your balance was between a certain amount. The Detroit Water Fund, um, which is, is sort of the new thing, I guess, that's replacing the 10, 30, 50 plan, um, will pay a certain amount of your past due bill. And, and the reason I believe it replaced it is that, of and um, Kurt Guyat from the ACLU reported on this, that of like the, it was over 20,000 people that were enrolled in payment plans. Like 400 of them were current with their payment. I mean, it was a really outrageous number. Um, so they revamped it a little bit and that's what the Detroit Water Fund is right now. Um, and then Thaw, so then nonprofits in the community have been picking up some of the the slack thaw though no longer has water any money left. Um, Wayne Metro can help people if they've paid two hundred 
dollars on their bill in the last six months, and if their balance is between one thousand and thirty five hundred. But if you are already on a payment plan, if you live in Section Eight housing or subsidized housing, you're not eligible for the program. Um, state how emergency. Many, how many people are in subsidized housing? Oh, I have no idea. I couldn't no. say. Sorry. I, I'm just wondering if that cuts out like. It, I would think it makes a significant uh, impact. Yeah, I, yeah. I would, I'm comfortable saying that. Um, the state emergency relief fund will give $175, but for a lot of these water bills, that is the tip of the iceberg. And it's, it's again, none of these provide long-term assistance. Um, and then there's a, a, another project, the Detroit Water Project, which matches donors up online with people who need help on their water bill. So um, a lot of times, you know, we have partner organizations like uh, we, the people of Detroit, that are doing emergency water deliveries, you know, of taking water, to, containers of water to people's houses where they need them. Um, there's still some water filling stations, but unfortunately a lot of those places are running out of money to supply people with water, and they shouldn't have to. <laughs> you know, that's the thing, like the city should be providing this service, and the sh city should really be more proactive in putting together an affordability plan. They do have a blue ribbon panel that they've put together that is assessing that situation. Um, but, you know, we they've been meeting since, I think, October um, and are supposed to have a report to city council in January. So we'll, we'll see what's happening with that then. So you, most of your time is spent on water issues in Detroit. Um, I'd say maybe 25% of my time. I, I was just wondering, we're at the end of the year, the end of 2015, what are some of your accomplishments? What are some of the things that you were actually able to achieve in 2015 um, in, in terms of water? In terms of water, I think we've made a lot of progress this year, um, really over the last year and a half in changing the dialogue. So specifically in Detroit, I'd say, Two years ago, and nobody even, you know, we were talking about affordability and nobody was listening. And now, you know, we've moved past like where people were finally catching on that, and I'm talking, you know, of our elected officials that assistance does not equal affordability and that there's a difference and that assistance plans aren't working and we need an affordability plan. And to even see that dialogue changing and moving towards a solution that I think we may be able to get behind um, is a big victory. So one of the things that was real important for us this summer in Detroit, um, they proposed increasing water rates 7.5%, um, and the city council voted that down. And they voted it down because a water affordability plan wasn't in place. And that was a huge victory. Now they went on to increase water rates a few weeks later, but that was contingent on setting up this blue ribbon panel um, and bringing in experts to figure out a way that they can put together an affordability plan for the state or for the city. So that was huge. Um, and I think we're, you know, every day we're, we continue to fight and we're getting closer. Having state legislation introduced is a huge victory for us. In terms of water affordability plan, wasn't there a plan introduced to the city council a couple of years ago? I think it was 19 or uh, 2008 or something, Maureen Taylor, I believe. That's yep. one of the things she continues to beat the drum on is you have an affordability plan. You've had it for like eight years and uh, you haven't turned page one on it. What's What's going on? Why do you have to come out yeah. with another affordability plan? You've got one. Just look at it and vote on it, and let's get this thing moving. So the Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, well, the original affordability plan was in, increased, or I'm sorry, uh, presented to City Council in 2005. It was approved by City Council in 2006. Um, the you know, water current was like, yeah, this is great. We can do this. We'll set this much money aside um, for it. And 
it just never moved forward. It never happened. And actually, the the director of the water department and the mayor, um, our infamous, sadly infamous mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick, were indicted on several federal charges because of what happened with the water. Um, Kwame also had other issues, but there were problems with the water. So that particular plan has been challenged all along because of um, opponents of it say that it will not stand up to um, the Headley Amendment um, and a decision called Bolt First Lansing that says that you can't charge people different rates for the same service. What we're arguing and what you know our legal experts say is that this will hold up to muster and that it, in fact, we're not charging people different rates. We're just providing people a discount when there is an inability to pay. Um, one of the things that I think is really positive is that um, one of the experts that helped Michigan Welfare Rights Organization put together that initial affordability plan is a member of that Blue Ribbon panel. And his name is Roger Colton. He was, um, he most recently helped uh, the city of Philadelphia put together their water affordability plan. I'm sorry, I got you off track. Um, That's okay. <laughs> I, I wonder if you can continue uh, talking about the highlights of yeah, 2015. Oh so, well, yeah, so that was a great highlight. I mean, I certainly think what happened in Flint, um, it, having Flint get switched back to Detroit Water and Sewerage Department is a highlight. Um, it's not often that we ask for something and get exactly what we ask for, and then that's what happened in that situation. And it is un and undoubtedly because of organizing by people like Melissa Mays on the ground who were just relentless in, in not letting that issue disappear and bringing in other organizations and other organizers who could you know, help support that work in, in different ways. Oh, what did you think of the media coverage of the Flint water crisis scandal? I think it took too long, honestly. I think that I wish people were paying more attention earlier on in the water crisis and that it wouldn't have happened. And, and maybe we would have had a resolution for folks sooner and it wouldn't have gotten as bad as it did. Um, but I think there was some fantastic reporting, um, you know, by Kurt Guy at, at the ACLU um, and Kate Levy, the documentary filmmaker, did an excellent job. What do you think of the coverage now of the Flint water crisis? Um, you know, it's interesting because now it's, it's, it's national news and there's um, some fairly good reporting on it nationally. Um, I guess my hope is that it continues to receive that type of coverage because it's really important in keeping pressure on our lawmakers to do something. And what we saw in Detroit was that after, you know, in Detroit, um, we filed a, a report with the United Nations and they filed a about the water shutoffs and they can file the complaint with the United States government in the state of Michigan. That sparked an international media frenzy that lasted months, but then it went away. Um, and the, the struggle here is still very real. The problems haven't gone away. Um, and I think it's really important to keep that keep reporting that coverage so because it just helps to keep pressure on our decision makers to do the right thing and they need to feel that they need to know that we're watching and that it's not just us that it's the whole country anyway i interrupted you again on the highlights of 2015. um i think those are like the big ones as it pertains to detroit and flint and, and again you know the bill package i think is something that um, is, is significant and we're working with our representatives and Congress in on national legislation and so that's all you know it's all progress and it's it's something that we fought a really long time for and it's been really nice to see some movement on it finally. What are some of the goals you would like to achieve 2016? 
2016. Um, well, I would definitely like to see um, Flint's water be safe and drinkable um, and affordable for folks. I would definitely like to see an end to shutoffs. Um, you know, not just in Flint and Detroit, but everywhere. They certainly aren't the only communities that have um, communities that have are struggling to pay very high water bills and. I think that moving toward you know, statewide legislation again that offers shutoff protection it is would be a huge victory. I mean, it's something that I think is extremely important. So I would say that the two things I want most is an end to shutoffs and an income-based affordability plans put in place. And how? What steps would you take in order to achieve those goals? Well, we are continuing to work, you know, we work in, within some great coalitions um, and it, it is certainly an all hands on deck type effort. And so we just, you know, we're keep, we keep doing the organizing that's needed. So we're working at the local level on our local officials, working to put pressure on them, whether we're doing visibility events or rallies or communicating with lawmakers or attending meetings. Um, all of that work is important and it, now it's something that we're not just doing at the local level but we're taking it to you know the state capitol and eventually DC. What kind of a toll does this take on you yourself emotionally? Ooh. I mean, it's really hard sometimes. Are, are you able to just like go home and kind of forget about the job and just have a normal life or is this with you all the time? No, I mean, I think it's with me all the time. I, you know, uh, one thing that, that, like I'm always thinking, of, I don't just turn my tap on anymore without thinking about it. I think that's one thing that I've learned and I can remember I mean, and this is kind of silly, but I guess, but I had cut my finger really badly over the winter and I, you know, had to clean it out every day and I'm sitting there washing, like running cold water over it. I should start crying because I'm like, oh my God, people can't do this. Like it just really, you know, it, it it's horrifying when you see people who you know, don't have access to this essential resource. And when you look at the numbers and see what I'm paying versus what they're paying, like, I'd love to show you um, this image, if I can find it really quickly, just comparing a water bill for um, a, a resident in Detroit um, and a resident in Ferndale who, same size household, um, and if I can't find it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, and we'll put it down in the description box below this video. Um, but it shows two water bills. One for, I can't find it now, terrific. Um, one for, or actually, hold on. I know what I can do. I can hold it up to the camera. Does this work? That yeah, works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yes, it, it works. Okay. So what you're looking at is two water bills, one from Detroit and one from Ferndale. And you can see that the one from this one right here, this is Detroit. It's a three, or I'm sorry, this is Ferndale. It's a three-month bill. It's for $98. This bill for same same or for one month in Detroit using less units of water is $103 and the discrepancy is in the sewage so Detroiters the main reason their water is unaffordable is because they're paying 83 percent of the sewage costs for the region and so to me like when I see that inequality and it's this injustice I mean it's just something that doesn't leave you I mean we're all connected to water and the people that I meet and the stories that they share with me are just, you know, there's something that are always with me. But we have a really great community and of organizers that we work with. We take time out to celebrate each other and our work, probably not enough, um, 
but you know when you're tired there's always somebody there to lift you up and I think it's 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 I work with amazing water warriors I couldn't I am very proud to work with the people that I work with. If there's a 12 year old girl out there watching this interview uh, and uh, she has a spark she wants to grow up and be just like you <laughs> what would you tell her what path would you tell her to go on is, is um geez I you know I think one thing that it is get involved in your community now and and see you know I think that wasn't something that I did when I was young I um but I think that there's a lot of value to it and I work I, I used to work in the food and water watch office in Florida and one of my favorite volunteers um Gabby was you know an elementary school student she was our best petitioner like she was always out collecting petition signatures and talking to people about our issues and she was amazing and she's an incredible activist and um I just, you know, I, I see her getting involved in things at a very young age and have a really complex understanding of social issues, and I think that's really important. So start early. Do you work with elementary, uh, middle school kids? Do you organize them at all, go in and, and teach them? I know you've got a master's in environmental education. Well, it's something that I don't get to do often enough. I, I'm more often, you know, um, working with adults, but um, it's something I wish I could do more if I had more time, for sure. Okay. Where do you see Flint in 2016? Do you see that they will get safe, affordable water? Do you think that's in their future, or do you think the politics is just too corrupt for that to ever happen? I think there's a really good chance. I know that we're not going to let up. Um, we're going to keep the pressure on. They have a new mayor, um, and and I, you know, am hopeful that the new mayor will provide some better leadership um, on these issues. And yeah, I mean, I think that all we can do is continue to work hard and put pressure on our lawmakers, and you know work to get them to do the right thing but i do i i am hopeful are you a hopeful cynic <laughs> yeah i guess so <laughs> i guess yes I, I think that's a fair assessment everybody i talk to seems to be a hopeful <laughs> cynic <laughs> yeah i think maybe you have to be in this line of work uh, before i before you go i wonder if you can talk about biofilm uh, no, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> you can't talk about bio because that, that seems to be the big deal in Flint right now. Where yeah. they're, they're throwing phosphates into the water. They're putting more and more chemicals into the water so they can create this biofilm around the lead pipes so the lead won't leach out as much to the citizens so that their lead levels will be a, in their blood will be a little bit less. So I was just wondering um, if you knew about this magic of Bio. uh, biofilm in well, the pipes. Yeah, what you said is probably all I know. I've, everything I learned or know I learned from the guys at Virginia Tech and, and the Flint Water page. So um, that's, you know, my limited amount of knowledge. But I guess from my understanding what happened is because the chemicals that they were putting in the water to treat the bacterial contamination was very corrosive. They didn't put in place the proper contro corrosion controls, which ate away at the existing biofilm. So that's what put all the lead in, in tin and copper in the water to begin with. So now there's the process of building that back up to make the, the pipe safer. But ultimately, and this is a trend we've seen are going to be continuing to see across the country. Our, our water systems are in desperate need of infrastructure upgrades. They're reaching the end of their lifespan, and we need federal funds desperately to be able to 
upgrade these systems so what happened in Flint is not happening in other places. Do you think we're going to see another Flint water scandal crisis? Oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> I certainly hope not. Um, You're a hopeful cynic, though. Yeah, I'm a hopeful cynic, so we'll see. I mean, I don't think yeah. anybody ever expected what happened in Flint would happen. Um, I think it took a lot of people by surprise. I think even, you know, the water shutoffs in Detroit, you don't expect things like this to happen in a developed country, let alone one of the richest countries in the world. And yet we continue to like marginalize our low income residents and not take care of people. Well, your region is rich in water. It is. It's really yeah. great lakes region. I mean, this should be the least of your issues, water. Yeah, well, I, you, you know, in Michigan, they say, we're never, I think it's more than eight miles from a body of water or 80 miles from a Great Lake. And I think he, there is this culture that we're so surrounded by water that we don't need to conserve it or, or protect it because we have so much of it. Um, and that is, you know, that's false. Like, we have a lot of issues here. And it's not just people in, in Detroit and Flint that don't have access. There's people all over the state, um, you know, in rural communities that are struggling to gain access to safe water. So it's, well, I, I asked you about if we will see another Flint yeah. uh, scandal issue, but actually... Flint is not the, the first city that had this scandal. Washington, D.C. had it yeah. back in 2004, 2006. And now Flint um, has had this happen to them, which is lead in their drinking water, polluting, contaminating, poisoning their population. As the politicians preach that it's safe. Yeah. There's no problem here until the grassroots, until it is proven to them that uh, there is a problem. But then again, once they have a problem, they just are trying to figure out solutions to mask it, throw, throw some phosphates into the water to, to, to mask the problem. So, you know, we've got Washington, D.C., Flint. Is, is, is this... Is this a trend? Is, could this be a trend since our water infrastructure is based so heavily upon lead, lead water pipes? It could be. I don't know. I mean, I haven't done the research, um, but it certainly seems plausible that as these aging systems begin to break down that we could see things like this be more prevalent. I certainly hope that's not the case, but again, I just haven't done the research to be able to speak about that. Before we leave, any closing comments? Anything we didn't cover you'd like to talk about? Um, no, but thanks for asking. Thanks for having okay. me. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we can talk in the green room when we get off the live stream. Okay. I'll see you next time. Whoops, right. I'll, put my, I'll put my screen back on so people can see my lips move. Uh, thanks so much for watching. My name is Jack Olmstead. I'm sitting in Port Townsend, Washington. We have lots and lots of water, lots of rain here. In fact, I play tennis, and there's a guy, he, he's an architect, and uh, he set up his house so he doesn't have to buy water from anybody. He collects all his rainwater, and he puts it in these big silos, and he uses it all year round. Maybe that's a solution for uh, some people out there. Um, when he comes back, he's he, he has a home in our area and then he goes down to California. So when he comes back, I'll, I'll do an interview with him and see if he can uh, show us around his property. Maybe that's a solution for some people, catching the rainwater and, and using that instead of depending upon the mis municipalities. Anyway, thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you next time. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and uh, Google+. That's where you're going to find our upcoming shows. Bye.